I but, hear that word yeah. one more time. <laughs> and moving recommendations. Forward, so. We pushed away recommending. Us here. Right. The, the, the next day, the county out. jumped back in there and said, Even oh, they were responsible for what we heard about. Recommendations. And where they were going to go once they got yeah. out. It's kind yeah. of crazy. Yeah. Best, best so I think we're all right. The chief's not coming this year. Yeah. yeah. He's on Zoom right now. Oh, well, well then. She's not going to come down here and get you in. But it seems like all the guys have supported they, they get lobbied and, and they get off. And so, yeah, I don't think they've been really good. Faithful mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. 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 Cherry, that's it. Is it planning? I do we have everybody on board up there? Uh, we got Steven and Paula. We just met some Daryl at this point. And so it looks like we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, we close there. Getting on. We bring up. Uh, yeah, we we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We could. He's downstairs. It would be nice to bring him up. Kind of again, then you get my wife. Uh, it's the discussion. If he didn't meet him, okay, I'll run downstairs. Well, I was making my mind. I'm going to jump your dog. I can stick it out for the end. Yeah. Well, hey, Darren, you want to come upstairs? And you just can't. <laughs> you can't. Oh. I think that'll make that go easier. Right. So if it's just there. One, one way or the other. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, people go over there. Yeah, you know, it's like the videos are killers. New video shows the like, Yeah, I was watching one of those uh, <laughs> thumb drive. The class A is all the buses. <laughs> Looks like the drive motor's in the back. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, man, that guy was just spinning everywhere. That thing you can see that. You can see it. get started. I mean, this bike. Yeah, the, uh, the, so the bike in the door to where the driver is not driven that long. Time that winter time. Time. They won't come to the bus. 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 Oh, 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 the yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. 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 Those ones are a center axle. Those are a lot better just now. It's uh, it's a, and so we're interested when they're going to throw the mini bomb in your house. And then they can see. That's just not cool. Yeah, I worry we're going to kill yeah. somebody. Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 there's too many local people from Spokane, and then every one. And who owns the gun? So we had a bunch of the transits. There's a little hard to turn well, our transits are some of times easier though because you have a hand so. We have waited great spots. That's just so that's interesting too. Is the the we heart, really the heart take the forty buses? Also, when you're at the got a few the heart all the way to the left. Um, at the knuckle, you'll be six inches over the river, and at the tail, you'll be eighteen. And then they they do that machine, and they did not like to. And it's weighted towards by Yeah, we have some that are one machine, fifteen seats long, so they're three seats or yeah, you know, like like hundred back. Three seats longer, longer than the normal like, school oh, bus. Yeah. The one twelve. We yeah. think about that all the time. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. So, and then when got, here, it's so that wasn't enough. Well, hey, we're having a conversation. <laughs> Is the sound or off? Can you hear me? Is it red? Can you hear me now? Yeah. There you go. All right, I guess by the clock on the wall on the city administrator, it is time to start the regularly scheduled December city council meeting. You please turn off your cell phones or silent them. That would be greatly appreciated. Is it green up on the top? Okay. 
Meeting is in order. Um, Chair, if you please lead us in the pledge. Okay. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Chair, can you please take the roll? Mike Hill. Ms. Halligan. Can you hear me? No, we can't hear you, Sherry. Uh, I unmuted. Stephen, can you do a sound check? Check, one, two, three. All right, can't hear, hear me. All right, man. Check. All right, there we go. Sherry? Can you hear me now? Can hear you, yes. Okay, Mike Hill? I'm here. Paula Laws? Here. Daryl Rickard? Here. Stephen Adams? Present through the Zoom. Mayor Holmes? I'm here. Let the record show we have a full forum. Number four, amendments to the agenda or conflicts. Anything, Council? Hearing none, we'll move forward. This is an action item, consent calendar approval. Mr. Deuce. Mr. Mayor, before us on the consent calendar this night, we have the regular council minutes from the November 18th city council meeting. Our regular and special bills is presented. And then also the acceptance of the Thayer Farms second additional plaque. Council, have any questions? Um, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. I'll second. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? Terry, if you please take the vote. Uh, Paula Laws? Aye. Daryl Rickard? Aye. Michael Hill? Aye. Stephen Adams? Aye. Motion passes. Moving on, passing by ceremonies and reports. Uh, we'll talk about the parade later. Um, number seven, visitors' comments. This is an opportunity to address concerns that are not on this current agenda. No formal action can be taken, therefore, but it can be put on a future agenda. So if anyone would like to come forward. Seeing none in the audience, do we have any on Zoom? Mr. Mayor, we do not have anyone that have raised their hands on Zoom that wish to speak. Okay, so we'll move forward. Eight, old business, we have none. Nine, public hearing. Uh, adoption of the 2018 building code with amendments. Uh, who's leading that? Darren, is Darren? Mr. You? Mayor, I'll start off and then we'll go to technical with Darren. Okay. Um, State, the state legislature adopted this last legislative session, the 2018 building codes, which is the international building codes for commercial, residential, existing building codes and so forth. Um, by state law, every city must adopt the building codes that the state has adopted in order to have a permitting process and building you know, inspections and so forth like that. Um, we only have to have a public hearing if we have amendments to those building codes. Um, we have had amendments to the building codes in the past. We're moving some of those amendments forward. You'll notice in the ordinance that there are some items that are crossed through, which means they are no longer needed as amendments because they're either already adopted in the codes as a whole or not needed anymore. Um, so we have those, but we are not adding any additional amendments to our building codes that we've adopted for the city of Rathdrum. Uh, and then I can turn it over to Darren if there's any technical issues that you would like to ask him. Darren, if you wanna make yourself available just in case there's questions. Councils, do you have any questions? 
Mr. Bill, um, we had just for clarification, we've adopted uh, these international building codes in the past. Yes, uh, the 2015 codes is what we have adopted right now. The codes come in a three year cycle, so 15, 18, 21. Uh, the 21 building codes are going to be looked at and considered by professionals all over the place and uh, submitted this next year. And then it'll go through the legislative process and then it'll go through to cities to be adopted again. But uh, generally speaking, we're on three to six years to adopt the codes, uh, depending upon what the state has adopted. And so we'll see those in the future, those change every three years. Thank you. And they always do run late like this. And there are many parts of it that are even later, like the technical plate is institute findings or so I, there personal, are some, there I are personally some. have worked on these building codes since the 2000 building codes uh, because in my former occupation I was the moderator between building officials and builders for the panel that worked together to decide what adoptions to be made and how to amend it in that process and it took a full year and a half to go through all of those to make those amendments on the state level and there's other standards that even run further behind in there. So I went through this when I used to own the trust plant, roof trust plant. That, um, you always wonder why it's so late. Okay, any questions? All right, let's open, open up the public hearing portion of this. So you all get a chance to speak for neutral or against and then um, staff may step in and I wouldn't use the word rebut but uh, rebut or give us more information so is anyone in the audience like to come forward and speak in favor of the um, consideration of the 2018 building codes Is there anyone would like to speak neutrally? Mr. Mayor, let's double check online. Okay. Uh, if there's anyone that would like to speak in favor of the building codes, if they please raise their hand on the Zoom meeting and we can allow them to speak at this time. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we do not have any. Surprising. Uh, would anyone like to speak neutrally? Mr. News? Uh, anyone online that would like to speak neutrally, please raise your hand at this time. And Mr. Mayor, we do not have anybody that would like to speak neutrally at this time online. Is there anyone in the audience or online that would like to speak against? Okay, well, I just want to check on you. See if you're right. Okay. I would like to speak against. Mr. Deuce? Uh, there's no one online that has raised a hand to speak in opposition to the building codes. All right, so I'll close the public portion of this. I see no reason for you guys to rebut anything or make other comments. And I would entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Oh, wait a minute. We're going to do this at 10A. So did you have questions? No. Okay, moving down. 10A, this is an action item. This should be con adoption of the 2018 building code with amendments ordinance. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that the 2018 building code with amendments ordinance be placed on its first reading by title only under suspension of the rules and to waiver its second and third readings. I'll second that. All right, uh, do I need a motion follow second? Um, any further discussion? Chair, if you please take the roll. Carol Rickard. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Mike Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. Motion passes. An ordinance of the city of Rockford, Idaho, a municipal corporation of the state of Idaho, amending Title IX, Chapter One of the City Code. Concerning international code setting forth authority for such action, findings of fact and conclusions of law. 
providing for severability, preemption and precedence, providing for the repeal of conflicting ordinances, providing an effective date, and providing for suspensions of the rules. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to adopt the 2018 building code with amendments to publish by summary only and to incorporate the title of the ordinance into the body of the summary. I'll second that. Uh, there will be a motion, Paul is seconded. Any further discussion? Sherry, if you would, please. Arrow record. Aye. Paula Laws. Aye. Michael Hill. Aye. Stephen Adams. Aye. Motion passes, moving on to 10B, and this is an action item. Consideration of the Thayer Farms Plan Unit Development, PUD, amendment. Mr. Mayor, um, we're going to have Carrie come up. She was downstairs. She's going to make the presentation on this. Uh, in light of trying to keep the number of people in the room limited, we've had them trade off during this part. It's, so all, it's all good. We appreciate it. You'll come up. So this is an amendment to the Fair Farms Plan Unit Development, which was reviewed and approved previously by the City Council. Let me just pull up my report here. All right. So as you know, the location of the Fair Farms PUD um, includes all of that area that was in the Thayer Farm subdivision, excluding the Thayer Homestead, which is that little square down the bottom, right in the corner of the property. The original proposal had 49 cottage lots, 61 traditional lots, and 69 estate lots. Those lots, the um, applicant did propose some um, floor plans um, for the houses to go on those lots. They did not in their calculations, however, include the area of garages or unhabitable space as part of their calculation for lot coverage. So as you'll see in the amendment here, the language updated the language a little bit to include the proposed house size, their average, which they were calling 1,200 square feet in the area previously. As city staff interprets what lot coverage is, and we'll get to that in a minute, they have not incorporated the area for garages. So in this proposal, they're increasing the size. Um, they're asking for the amendment in order to increase their lot coverage so that they can incorporate those garages, cover decks in other areas. So there would be no changes to the lot coverage for the estate lots which of course are those large lot developed within the development with uh, maximum lot size, average lot size about 36,600 square feet. So the amendment for the lot coverage 
would just be for the traditional and cottage lots. The cottage lots are 5,210 square feet a minimum, and the average lot size for the traditional lots is 7,000 square feet. As you see in the map, this was the original phasing of the project. The cottage lots are mostly located within the green areas of this map, and the estate lots are mostly located in pink to the eastern side of the development. Um, little pointer doesn't work for TV. <laughs> is the larger lots. So and then in the middle of those is in the middle of those are the traditional lots. So these were the deviations from code that were originally approved by the city council with this plan unit development and also the amendments that they're requesting. So the proposed amendment in red here is our maximum lot coverage for the cottage and um, cottage lots and traditional lots from 35%. They're asking for an increase to 45%. They're also asking that accessory structures be able to be placed within five feet of a property line, regardless of which direction the roof slope is. Um, I went through the comparison. Um, this was mostly for planning and zoning. So I'll go ahead and show it to you guys as well. This is a comparison of some other jurisdictions and what their lot coverage requirements are. Um, Coeur Lane doesn't have a lot coverage requirement or a lot coverage maximum. Um, and the, the other comparisons here are all on lots that um, are similar lot sizes. Yeah, go ahead. When you mentioned um, accessory buildings uh, within five feet, regardless of direction of the, the pitch of the roof, uh -huh. can you define what, what constitutes accessory buildings? Is that garages or is that just sheds? It's a detached structure, any detached structure. So both. Yeah, it could be a detached structure for sure. Thank you. Yep. So as you see, the lot coverage is um, in other jurisdictions. We have Hayden, Sand Sites, Wakan Valley, Early Heights, Cheney, Post Falls. Um, the city of Athens is 35% maximum. Other jurisdictions range from 35% up to 50% on similar lot sizes. So lot coverage, as we define it, is measured by the total ground coverage or area of all buildings or structures on a site measured from the outside of exterior walls or supporting members. So that includes a porch supported by posts. You would measure to the exterior of the post. So again, in the calculation that the applicant was using in order to design the subdivision, they were not incorporating those as lot coverage, and they were also not counting non habitable spaces like garages. It's kind of a difference in how you how you define lot coverage, whether you're a real estate agent or a city planner. <laughs> so a real estate agent considers a twelve hundred square foot house as 1,200 square foot of livable area. And that's how it was approached by the, the applicant. The city can consider the 1,200 square foot house as 1,200 square feet of footprint measured to exterior walls. So we don't count impervious surfacing towards lot coverage. So we have other stormwater standards, so that doesn't, doesn't really factor into it. Um, so again, lot coverage major to exterior walls um, and we do have some provisions that allow, allow some extra um, eave um, footprints and things like that so accessory building setbacks as you know those were within a recent code revision um, earlier this year or last year um, and the intent of the provision that we provided um, for uh, the slope side of roofs or the east side of roofs to be located at least 10 feet from property lines um, in order to help that slope try to extend from roofs. 
and they're asking for um, just five feet regardless of the height of the structure or the direction that the roof slides. And the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend a condition of approval to address that. The recommended conditions of approval are recommending approval of the amendment to the PUD. Um, and the recommended conditions of approval are in no case shall any structure be placed within a residential building zone and so a restricted building zone and show, as shown on the plot of record that deals with bio pits and other areas that are on the plot. Um, with what? I'm sorry? It deals with what? Bio pits. Which is so they're areas where they dug for soil during infrastructure development and then they filled it back in with undocumented fills normally. So it, it actually states on the plot of record that there are no build areas. This is just kind of a safeguard for future planners to remind them when they're looking at if, if we're placing accessory structure potentially within that area to make sure they look at the plat and make sure that they're not putting it in one of those areas. And the other provision is that accessory buildings shall have composition roofing, which will help with the snow sliding. Um, the applicant did agree to that and stated that um, that's also included within their HOAs. However, the city does not control HOAs and they are subject to change. So PNZ did ask that it would be a condition of approval. Again, they are, they are recommending approval with those recommended conditions. And staff has also included recommended findings of fact and conclusions of law in the staff report. And because only one hearing was required for this amendment, um, the applicant, um, they, they can probably answer questions, but not provide any testimony as part of the hearing. So if you have questions, I would appreciate that you direct them to me. Council, do you have any questions? We do. Mr. Hill, can you explain what the purpose of, of a minimum lot coverage, what, why why can't somebody build 90% of their lot? What's the, what's the purpose of having those minimum lot coverage uh, standards? So it's a maximum lot coverage sorry, standard? Thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> those density provisions, um, whether they're heights or setbacks or maximum lot coverage, um, some some places have um, other other codes dealing with building articulation and things like that are intended to deal with the perceived bulk of a building on a property. So any one, any one of those um, standards can be a limiting factor. Any or all of them can be a limiting factor in what you can build on a lot. And the way that the way that Coeur d'Alene provides um, for their limitation instead of doing a lot coverage is they have um, their setbacks, which I didn't compare the differences in their setbacks, and then they have also their parking standards, which help limit that as well. And you can you can limit it through one, the other, or both. Almost all jurisdictions do it through both. Um, again, it's just it's a, a perception of the bulk on, on a lot and in keeping with the character of a neighborhood, um, aesthetic standards, that kind of thing. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Ripper. So I'm just curious, uh, there, I don't have a problem with the deviation of, um, of the, what's on the land, but I do have a problem with uh, the deviation of the uh, setbacks for the outbuildings. Is there any way this amendment can be pa passed without that part of it? You can, you can condition it um, that either provide for a differing standard or that um, specify that on a condition that setbacks shall meet the code standard that's been adopted for all properties in the city. Yeah, in my opinion, I don't have a problem with the footprint deviation, but I, I think that we should consider uh, holding back on that part about the 
setbacks just because of what's going on in the city right now. With setbacks. With setbacks. It's kind of a hot subject as it is. Well, I'm sitting here thinking that there'll be RVs, there'll be motorhomes, there'll be boats. I'm just talking about like the sheds and stuff that. No, I get that, but you take those spaces away and pretty soon all it comes out on the road. Yeah, I just think that it should stay with if the city ordinance is 10 feet, that, that we should not change it for a PUD. That's my feeling on it. Not, the rest of it I'm okay with, but not changing that part of it. Okay, I have a question, mm -hmm. and I'm almost afraid to ask it because I'm afraid the answer might be. When a grassy swale is engineered, does the total lot coverage, is that a factor on the size or the shape or the depth of a swale? Is that part of the engineering? Yes and no. <laughs> I, think, I think what you're probably referring to as far as engineered swales are usually right-of-way improvements. Um, and those swales are engineered to deal with just the stormwater from the right-of-way infrastructure. Road sidewalks. Those so it's things. only the right way then. It's only the right way. So it's that thirty-five percent that came from actually water being able to yeah, seep with, into the ground yeah, rather than it helps with water road. infiltration. But again, it's not. Um, we don't include impervious surfacing in our setbacks, um, and we can require an engineer's site plan for a residential lot. We don't normally because most people tend to not pave their entire lot. Um, I have had that happen before. I have had to require a residential lot to provide an engineered stormwater plan when they wanted to put a patio on 90% you know, of their lot. Um, but, but it is a consideration that, um, you know, uh, obviously a roof is an improvement surface, so. Okay, my other question, and I would think I should know this one too, but I don't. Is the comp route, I know it's on the homeowner associate, is that tied to their deed or will there be future fights when somebody comes in after they put their metal roof up over their ship? Uh, uh, there can be. I mean, um, it's right now, there's obviously a new development of that because homeowners association or, sh or should be as lots are selling. Um, and that would be included in. The, that HOA and their bylaws, but you know those are subject to change, and they don't require any review or approval of the city or anything like that. So um, that's why we have asked it for for um, inclusion. But, and I believe that um, during the planning zone meeting, that there was testimony that all of the sheds that have currently, all of the outbuildings that have currently been built in there have composition roofs. So at this point, there aren't any metal roofs. Um, and if they end up in there, they become an enforcement issue. Yeah, I, I, excuse me, I'm looking at it from the administrative end here. Yeah. That, is, that can be a nightmare when, because people will start changing now. Oh, yeah. And people will go over to Sears and buy a metal roof or a metal shed. Which kind of goes to your setback thing. Any other questions? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hill. <laughs> The purpose of a PUD, as we discussed before, um, if we just kind of reiterate why a PUD is necessary and what its purpose is and what its give and take is, why, why that's... Um, yeah, so a planned unit development allows for a developer to um, deviate from certain standards of code that are approved by city council. And generally, that's in exchange for some kind of a public benefit. Um, state law discusses that it's generally for a public benefit. Our code doesn't, um, which we've already identified as something that we want to look at, um, including that language in a future amendment. However, um, they did, of course, with the original PUD, um, there were dedications of land, um, all of that area that's underneath the BPA easement um, is to be dedicated as public lands, uh, open space. Um, they are including walking paths within that area and also within tracks that run through the plot. There's also a dock park um, that they will be improving and which will be dedicated and a pickleball court 
with parking lot, which will be improved and dedicated as well. So those were all with the original five. They didn't, um, with the original PUD approval, um, they, didn't, uh, they didn't include any additional um, items with the amendment. Um, so. And then one more topic here that um, we've talked that we've discussed this topic before about um, general lot coverage, um, that minimum 35%. I know that we've um, had that brought to us before, and it seems like that that's something that um, the developers are encouraging the city to um, perhaps um, reconsider our minimum, or, or I'm sorry, maximum lot coverage allowed. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, so if, if that's, that seems like that's the more appropriate place to do this is, is to allow for the community to, um, to be, apply the same standards to all of them, um, as opposed to that this one's allowed to, to do something that's outside of those boundaries. That's just my opinion. Yeah, and we, um, the developer chose to move forward in that way at this time. We weren't proposing any other zoning amendments that were. Right. <laughs> but we weren't proposing any other zoning amendments that were coming forth. So this was the most expedient way for them to move forward with construction. Um, in their development, which, which is progressing rapidly. And Mr. Mayor, if I can add to that, that they asked us as staff, especially as specifically me, which would be the best way to go to handle this in a speedily fashion. Um, and I knew that in amending the code, there would be several public hearings, there'd be several workshops, there'd be several other things that would have to take place in order to amend that code. Uh, the amendment of the PUD would be very specific, targeted, and so forth. So it would be able to allow them to do that because they've got buildings going up and customers trying to purchase homes and build in those homes. Um, it is something that we'll probably be looking at at uh, the future standards change that we've got coming in the zoning stuff. And we may be seeing that sooner than later, uh, which at the time when they asked about amending it wasn't necessarily coming up so thank you so where did 35 percent come from did anybody research that it's it's kind of a it's kind of an industry standard <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's pretty typical but you i mean you saw the comparison that carrie showed i mean it's anywhere from 35 percent to 50 percent mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it really is up to the jurisdiction themselves on what kind of standard they want to have for their own community. That's so it. I think Sandpoint was the other 35%. And then uh, Spokane Valley goes up to 50%. And I've heard in other cities they do, uh, I think it shows in Airway Heights, 35% for the dwelling but you can expand that up to 50% for accessory structures and, and other things that you're adding on after the fact. So, I mean, it, it's the standard that the city wants to establish and, and, and follow. Yeah, so it likely relates back to the, um, historically the types of density that, um, uh, and again, the appearance of both on a lot um, that Rothram has desired. Um, with larger, larger lot development um, and less density in general. So 30, 35 to 50 is pretty standard for residential zone district for maximum lot coverage. Okay, I'm a believer that it should be based on some reasoning rather than being totally arbitrary. Um, Paula and uh, Stephen, do you guys have any questions? No, I don't. Stephen? Let's no, no questions. No questions. Mr. Hill? Um, the zoning in this, what's the property zoning? The underlying zoning is R1, 10,000 square foot zone district. 
So the total density for the, pro the project density is limited to that zoning. Um, but again, the PUD, they were able to um, deviate from minimum lot sizes and setbacks and other things. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hearing any no other questions, I guess it's time to go fishing for a motion if there's one sitting out there. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion that we consider the uh, amendment to the PUD uh, with retracting the uh, part about the setbacks. When you say retracting, you mean not including the not including the, not including the uh, setback changes or need. I'll do that. Oh, does, Paul, if you'd like to say, are you referring? Only to accessory buildings, or are you referring to the whole project? No, it's, it's accessory buildings. Okay. And Paul, are you still a second? Second, yes. Okay, so Daryl made a motion. Paul is seconded. Any further discussion? Sheriff, you please take the roll. Daryl Rickard? Aye. Paula Laz? Aye. Michael Hill? Nay. Stephen Adams. Nay. Mayor Holmes. Aye. Moving forward, this is an action item. Consideration of the 2021 meeting calendar. Mr. Mayor, um, and council before you is, uh, it's about that time of the year that we start looking at next year's meeting calendar. Um, on the screen is the um, proposed meeting dates for next year. Um, this stays with the traditional um, second Wednesday and fourth Wednesday of every month with a couple of exceptions, those being in November and December, basically for the same reasons that we saw this year. The fourth Wednesday of November is the day before Thanksgiving, and the fourth Wednesday in December is the Wednesday before Christmas. Not exactly before Christmas. I believe Christmas is on a Saturday, but just so you know, it's the Wednesday before Christmas. This works for me. Council, you have any questions? Nope. Does this not need a motion to set the dates? Um, Yes. Yes, Mr. Mayor, it does, and it is an action item, but it's just a motion to accept the dates. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the uh, 2021 meeting calendar as presented. Second. Motion by Mr. Hill and a second by Daryl. Any further discussion? Chair, if you please take the roll. Michael Hill? Aye. Daryl Record? Aye. Paula Laws? Aye. Stephen Adams? Aye. Motion passes. We're on D, discussion of the comp plan. Who's up, Connie? Are you leading off or? I am. Okay. Fight it over. See who's doing it. Just a second, Mr. Mayor. I'm getting the PowerPoint presentation brought up. All right, Connie, I think you are ready to go. Lights up and ready to roll, or there we go. Okay. And you're unmuted. Okay. All right, we haven't done a dry run on the show, so hopefully everything will go well. Um, my name is Connie Kruger, and I um, have met with several of you. Um, we actually started the comprehensive plan update process, um, as you're aware, in the fall of 2019. We were rolling along into the winter of 19 and early 2020 when um, COVID-19 came along and kind of 
put a stop to the process. And so um, what I'd like to do tonight is to catch you up with um, what was accomplished over the winter of 1920 and what has been happening since then and then what the next steps are as we go along. And you can see some of the materials that we put together and um, some of the analysis. Um, my computer is not live right now, so Leon's doing the presentation for me. And there are a couple of points where he'll have to depart from the PowerPoint to pull up a few links to show you um, some of the tools and some of the information that we have. Um, so you may see little pauses here and there. Let me do something real quick before I end, so. Okay. Want to make sure that the public is seeing what we're seeing on the screen. So. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. So tonight um, we're having a little bit of a different meeting format. This is actually a joint meeting of the City Council and the Planning and Zoning Commission. So um, some of the Planning and Zoning Commission members may be here or they may be um, joining us online. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the process, um, some of the changes that we've had to do with the process just given the current situation, um, the required components of a comprehensive plan, um, we'll talk about the stakeholder and the agency interviews, your population projections, um, a exercise that we're engaged in called the billable lands analysis and um, some annexation analysis related to that. Look at um, just some real um, simple demographics and then talk about uh, the future meetings and, and also the public outreach process. So this is the process that we um, engage in and started in the fall of 2019. And so um, early fall, we started with the award of the contract and that led to review of all the city's various plans, transportation plans, park plans, um, quite, a, quite a number of different plans that the city has in effect and adopted. Um, then we engaged in the agency interviews <coughs> and the stakeholder interviews and started the process of developing population projections working on an infill buildable lands inventory at the time, and then working on some of the demographic information. But we didn't move too far into the demographic information because there's a census update that um, is underway. And so we were kind of waiting on the results of some of that to move forward. Um, right at the time that um, your planner, Carrie Cease and I were meeting to talk about the big public outreach meetings that we were planning, um, is really when we started to realize that um, COVID-19 was going to put um, a damper on our ability to be in with the public. And so we stopped the process at that point in time. Um, we, on our side, we're still working a little bit on reconciling the data. And um, that really has been um, on hold. And so if you take a look at this process that we have up there, um, had we been you know, following the standard process, we were working right there in those demographics and creating the meeting materials. And then we were getting just ready to move into that great big public meeting. We had the, um, I think it was Betty Kiefer who booked and we we had a date and had worked with the superintendent of Sierra down and, and everything was ready to roll. And so we ended up canceling those plans. Um, the traditional process from there would have picked up, um, we think with a public survey and then all the results of all of this information would have been combined together to create um, kind of a strategic update. So leading to a draft of your plan. And then we plan to engage in the planning and zoning workshops, city council, draft the plan and move through the adoption hearings. Um, so what has changed now? Um, obviously we've completed um, all of the preliminary steps. Um, since that time, we do have um, a little more recent census data that we're working with, and so we're working to update um, some of the information the plan with that. Um, the buildable lands analysis, as we start to realize the annexation demand that the city ha has had um, in the last year or two, um, we really realized that we needed um, not just an inventory of what was going on on the ground, but maybe um, a modeling tool to look at different density scenarios and to figure out how the city might want to move forward. Um, similar to the discussion that you just had tonight, um, there are ranges of lot sizes that cities can employ. There are ranges of lot coverage that cities can employ. Um, they can allow you to um, build to 
greater heights or lesser heights. And so this will be, you know, really engaging in an exercise where we take that expected population de demand, we determine how many housing units that represents, and then we go out and we look at your land and determine, you know, how do you allocate that? And how do you balance that with things like maybe a desire for more rural um, lots or um, maybe some multifamily housing or just a variety in the density of housing that you offer all, all together. And so um, we'll talk a little bit tonight about that tool, and then you'll see more about that in some of the forthcoming meetings. Um, so probably the, the biggest thing that we've been grappling with is how to do the public process. And um, because we, we can't to do those great big public meetings. Everything was ready for it. We had all the boards, we had everything ready for it. Um, and so now what we realize, of course, is um, like everyone that we need to move, you know, to more of an online meeting format, you know, hoping that we're reaching people, but open to ideas to, you know, on how to do that. Um, but one of the things that we plan to do tonight is to, um, we'll be putting out an email address where you can contact the city. These videos will be out on YouTube. And, um, you know, the city will really be trying to reach out and get people to engage in this process. And so we, we thought would be the best thing to do is rather than just kind of going out and holding a public meeting where people really haven't had an opportunity to receive all the information is to bring the public along with us. And so as we do these YouTube um, you know, meetings, people will have an opportunity to watch them now. They can watch them at a later point in time. They can email us with their thoughts and, um, you know, just different things that, that they may be thinking and kind of do the process that way. And so that's part of why we're combining the Planning Commission and the City Council together in these meetings is to bring everybody along in their awareness of the information that's being provided to City Council and Planning Commission. And then hopefully to kind of winnow those comments down and everybody gets to see the breadth of the information they're receiving. Um, so we're hoping that that will be a successful format. Um, and then we will, you know, we'll see as we move along. Um, as part of that, we may end up doing a public survey and we've talked about doing sequential surveys, maybe as we go in and we talk about a topic during the survey, um, it's a little more limited or maybe doing one at the end. Um, but something that, you know, would really be, again, kind of narrowed in this focus after we receive all the information. And then with that, um, we're looking at picking up the process in a pretty similar format, drafting your strategic update areas and but in this case then going ahead since we've worked together all the way along and you know, having a planning and city council doing combined workshops drafting a plan and holding your public hearings typically those are easier to hold separately but we might even look at combining the public hearings on those so we'll you know we'll see how that process will unfold um so going back to um idaho code idaho code requires in your comprehensive plan that you address certain elements and um, the city's current comprehensive plan has addressed many of these, but not all of them. But you are required uh, by state law to address property rights, population, school facilities and transportation, economic development, land use, natural resources, hazardous areas, public services, facilities, and utilities, transportation, recreation, special areas and sites, housing, community design, Agriculture, if you have it and if you're planning to preserve it, um, have an implementation chapter and any national interest electric transmission corridors and your public airport facilities. And so what we really see since the law changed from your last update is there's a real emphasis on the um, national interest electric transmission corridors and your public airport facilities. And so, you know, under state law, they're saying, hey, be sure that when you update your plan that you're taking these into consideration. And so those will be uh, new elements in your confidence plan. There are some things that as we can move through the stakeholder interview process that we really realize that we need to add that are going to be unique to uh, the Rathroom Conference and plan. And um, I'll go over there a little bit more at the end of the presentation. So what I want to talk to you about, because it has been a year, is to understand the stakeholder interview process and who all was involved with that. And we actually had 25 different um, individuals that were involved with interviews, representing agencies, representing private landowners. Um, but again, as councils and planning commissions are making decisions on these documents, um, this is to really draw your awareness to you know, who, who has been 
hope we have these in-depth discussions with today. Um, it has been a year. Sometimes representation changes little. I think we've had a little bit of change on planning and zoning. Um, but most of the, the people that were involved are still here and are involved with the city. Um, so given that, um, starting with some of the um, more of the community organizations or agencies, uh, we have Northern Lakes Fire District, the Lakeland School District, and we spoke with both the superintendent and the finance director. We spoke with the director of the Rathroom Senior Center, the Rathroom Chamber of Commerce. We had two representatives and the Jacqueline Land Company. And we did interview the Jacqueline Land Company because they represent a fairly large land holding um, to the south of town along Highway 41. And that's an area where you can have quite a mixture of different uses. And so that was something where we really wanted to, you know, sit down with them and kind of understand what their thoughts were. Also met with the Planning and Zoning Commission. The members at the time were um, Jacob Moynier, Deborah Curry, Curtis Carr, and Austin Schumann. And um, it's to the city council with uh, Mayor Vic Holmes, Paula Laws, who's your council president, and Dale Ricard, Stephen Adams, and Mike Hill. And I think that um, two of the city council members were actually uh, new city council members. And so this is another thing that um, now that you've had, you know, a year uh, in service, it will be uh, interesting to see as we look back on some of these comments. Uh, are your thoughts the same? Have they changed? And so I think this is actually kind of a unique opportunity that we have here. We have incoming council members to be able to look at things a little bit again. Uh, with the Rathroom City staff, uh, the city administrator, Leon, uh, with the police chief, Tommy, public works director, Kevin, public works inspector, Mike, city planner, Carrie, your parks and recreation Derek, director, Eric, and your finance director, Melissa. And we really wanted to meet with all of these people um, to be sure that we were looking at the operational needs of the city, that we weren't over here doing land use plans, that the finance director would later disagree with, or that your public works director would say, hey, that's a great plan, but we didn't plan at all for utilities, and that's an area that we know we can service, or that it will cost a lot of money to service, um, or it would be better to direct growth over here. And so really trying to bring that balance um, into the discussion. So for the interview process, the city selected the interviewees and each of these interviews ranged from one to three hours. So these were not a small um, little 20 minute sit downs. These were pretty extensive periods of time. There were pre-designed questionnaires that were standardized to really give everybody the same question, but give everybody the opportunity um, to answer them. And with that, we had, of course, lots and lots of unique responses. And so one of the things that I really believe in in the years of doing this kind of work is that um, it's not my job to filter. It's my job to document. Um, and especially in small towns, you know, every idea is a good idea and it tends to come back and be recirculated. So if they're coming, they're coming up um, in an interview if, if, you know, I would have pushed it to the side and not think it was important or, you know, maybe talk to somebody on staff and they didn't think it was important. Um, inevitably, those types of things um, come back again in two years and three years. And so this was really an opportunity to come in and to document all of those different thoughts that folks have and make sure that we weren't losing an opportunity for maybe a program or a project and, you know, just kind of waiting it out prematurely mm -hmm. before it's time. Um, so with that, um, worked very, very hard not to place a spin on or interpret any comment they were documented. And uh, following that, there was a master database that was created with each set of comments. And this was about a two-month process putting together these comments and then taking them and we reviewed them and, and looked at each from the perspective of, is this a Comment related to policy? Is it related to plan? Is it related to a project? Um, you can make one comment about something, and it could be a comment that might have an implementation component that's a project, and it might also need to be a policy. So you might have a comment, let's say, related to annexation. And so you may need policy guidance on how to do annexation, but you may have a really practical recommendation on how to do it. And so we ran it through this filter 
so that if it needed to be placed in different contexts that it was, that we weren't just kind of taking it at face value later on and, um, you know, maybe putting the wrong spin on it. So really trying to be comprehensive and look at it from all angles and say, hey, it could be long here, here, could be a project element. And you'll see some of that as we go along. Um, so at that point in time, there was a huge database of comments. Um, and so what we did is we went through process of looking for which of these comments had a commonality and how frequently did we see them. And so these have been um, basically then the things that we truly felt were exactly the same comment were brought together and they were ranked by frequency. And so we're going to look at the frequency of some of these comments. And I think this will be really important for the Planning Commission and City Council to be able to go back and look at and say, hey, do we agree with this? Um, because ultimately you're adopting your plan and collecting them. Um, these are also placed within the context of future plan chapters and in the, in the land use now. And so the idea behind that is um, taking that idea now that we found it, that it could be in one area and it could possibly reoccur in another area and going ahead and counting it forward. And what you see when you do that is you see that the majority of the comments can be implemented. And this is something that came up during the interviews is, you know, how do you take all these contradictory things and make them work? Um, well, often we find that there's a place for them um, pretty much anywhere. It's just kind of finding the right you know, place for it. And um, with this too, I think that there was a really strong message that was coming from the city leadership about um, wanting to make sure that this is a plan that could be implemented. And we hear this all the time. Um, I think you kind of grow tired of hearing it, but well, you know, we don't want to adopt a plan and put it on a shelf. And, you know, people say that often and often it's kind of in the context of, well, we want to make sure that it hits on the right things. But even if it hits on the right things, often it still gets put on the shelf. And so with this, um, what, what part of your implementation program will be is this um, kind of a new section called making it work. And with this, there will be recommended ordinance updates, um, strategic plans that you may want to do, some capital improvement planning, um, items related to impact fee programs, um, your um, urban renewal districts, you'll see that. Administrative actions, communications was a huge element, was internal and external communication and trying to work to improve that. So taking those ideas and incorporating them into that. And then of course your future land use now, which tends to be the item that everybody looks at most often. And so again, trying to make this really useful. It's not just about amount. So with that, the stakeholder and agency interview results, um, we had um, comments that range, I have I, quite a number of these. I'm gonna actually advance the couple of slides. Um, these are all of those comments from that huge database just kind of drilled down to frequency. Um, so it doesn't look like as much here, but there still is quite a bit there. And so we have everything from comments that, approved, that appeared you know, two times, and there were quite a number of those. So again, oh, great ideas that we'll find within that. Then we saw, you know, some of these where the frequency of those comments um, increased. And so the range that we really, you know, kind of want to focus on here is these ones that were probably, you know, three or four in a row. Um, we had some of these that appeared as many as 18 times in different interviews that we had. And so I think this is a really good tool for planning commission and city council to be able to look at and say, listen, you interviewed 25 individuals and this came up 18 times. This is probably a big focal point that we need to look at with our comprehensive plan. Um, so the item that we really um, saw, a couple that we saw quite a bit of focus on um, was emergency management. There was a huge focus on that and that ranged everywhere from um, needing more training, awareness, disaster preparedness for transportation, an increase in emergency staffing, scenario planning, restoring your monthly preparedness meetings, preparing for railroad, fire, and snow school shooting preparation, and implementing your community emergency response team training, which is called CERT training. And then there was also some discussion about creating a new emergency commission. Um, the next item that came up um, 18 times were that just people were generally concerned about growth. 
And so as we get down into some of these tools related to growth, we'll you know kind of explain a little bit more about ways that we might be able to work with that. Um, the next item was addressing traffic congestion safety, which came up 10 times. Um, nine times we heard that um, the city needs to increase external communication. And six times we heard about moving the city hall and creating a consolidated campus. We heard five times about the need to address staffing issues at city hall and five times about the need to create a vibrant downtown. Um, we heard it a little bit more on this uh, city hall and consolidated campus with kind of an idea of, the, of this community center. And it, it seemed to kind of be tied back into that, but it could be independent, um, which is here. And that's creating a community center that houses events and entertainment. And so in these interviews, we drilled down on this quite a bit. And we had some opinions that tended to lean toward that it should function like a mini croc center with gym space, it should be used for weddings, movies, a gymnasium for city and school programs, possibly a small bowl and alley and pool tables, and then a funding source for that should be established. And we heard five times of the need to create more interconnectivity with pathways between neighborhoods and regional trail systems. The items that we heard about and everything on this we heard about um, four times were the need to create additional professional office areas downtown to address your bedroom community status. So in other words, creating local jobs where people did not need to commute out of the community. Um, planning for commercial along Highway 41. And in this case, that wasn't specific to any one section of Highway 41. In some other comments, it was a little more specific in certain areas. But this was really kind of universally along the Highway 41 corridor and trying to plan for that. Um, increasing the number of locally based job opportunities. Um, and this wasn't as much about commuting outward, it's just having that as the foundation of your community. Um, increase awareness of city plans, and one idea was creating one-page summary sheets or posters where um, you know, people would be able to come in and get information about the community and what they have planned. Um, a lot of people weren't aware of the number of plans. That Ralph Rims done some great planning, but he wasn't aware of all of it. Um, we also heard four times about the need to zone for some larger residential lot sizes and the need to create opportunities for industry with jobs for young people and for retirees in livable age. And then we heard four times about creating affordable housing. Um, three times, we heard about the need to increase internal communication, removing the property east of Meyer from live industrial zoning and looking at residential uses. The need to address potholes and roadway conditions to create more entertainment and that was really for children and for families. It was really widespread, the need, and actually for seniors, it was for all age groups for the need to go in and create more entertainment within the community so that you didn't need to drive to Court Lane and other areas. Um, to zone for larger lots, but in this case, specifically with setbacks large enough for shops and for motor homes. Um, a comment that you're growing too fast three times. Extending the highway commercial south on Highway 41 and creating design standards for setback requirements. So this was like really focusing in on that area south of town as you move down, you know, toward Vocal and Prairie as you expand yes. southward. And how do you design for that area? Because you're going to have limited access um, there on Highway 41. <coughs> And um, so with that, looking at landscaping and possibly some backage roads to provide for access, but allowing for pedestrians to be able to access the front of this development. Um, this also came up, um, the idea of investigating, creating a URD in that area to pay for streets and wet and dry utilities in the area. Um, and there was also a discussion about continuing the Raft of Mountain development in accordance with adopted plans. You guys have an excellent, um, fairly current plan. And, um, you know, so continue implementing this, bring on the zip line, bring on some of this golf course, look at some of those ideas that you're looking at implementing. And then also the ADA access should really be focused on in developing that that you should maintain a police presence and the current level of service as the city expands. And so we found out from the police department that the right now that um, 
you know, they're offering a lot of services that really just are really nice services that, you know, people in the community really um, have come to expect. And it creates kind of that sense of small town um, round trip and people value that. And so some, some of the examples were um, including shoveling stone, changing batteries, not the things that maybe you typically would think of, but I think they were just examples of, hey, we've been able, we have the ability to be able to stop and talk to people and provide a level of service to them. And we don't want to discontinue that where the police department um, isn't helpful in the community. They're just kind of out there anonymously responding to things and want to be part of the fabric of the community. Um, the, there was a desire to investigate snow burn removal program options specifically to help the seniors and the disabled um, and a desire to support the needs of the school district and that included investigating the use of impact fees um, to investigate the long-term viability of the relationship with post falls through wastewater treatment and you know it's just concerns that as you start to grow and as post fall starts to grow but that's really at the forefront of everyone's mind. You know, are we looking at that? Are we being proactive? Are we being um, relationship oriented with those falls and, and communicating well? Um, there was a desire to create goals and policies around becoming a self-sufficient city and to work with big box retailers to provide their own loss prevention hires. So currently, um, you know, and we, we hear this virtually everywhere when you bring in bigger box stores the you know, shoplifters, things like that, take a lot of your local police forces time. So, you know, being able to work with them and say, hey, can you help us to address this so that we can continue to serve the needs of the community. There was a desire to recruit additional medical providers in around them to assist with response times and offer acute care hours. And um, also a desire to just create and maintain a unique identity and create a cool place. And this isn't inclusive of just the downtown. This was really about, hey, how does a route from as the rest of the prairie grows out, the cities grow closer, how do we create our own unique area? And what does that look like? Um, we have lots more comments and I am not going to go through all of them, but these are things that I would like to provide you to be able to take a look at. And you know, each of you go back, read through them in your own time. And um, I think these are going to become the discussion points. So are these really, you know, our priorities? Are these what, you know, we're going to shape our plan with? The nice thing about this is that every idea is out there for everyone to look at. It doesn't have any one name attached to it. You, you don't look at a comment and say, well, that came from so-and-so, and I, and I kind of know where they're oriented. It's just neutralized. Like, here are some good ideas that people have brought up. Here are concerns people have. Let's put them out there and just see, you know, kind of in a neutral environment, what was most frequently addressed. And I really do think that as we look at these, that these will become kind of a foundation for what the policy for the comments and plan will have. Um, so I'll be providing this information um, to Carrie and then having her provide that to you or to Leon. Um, we did get this wonderful comment here two times that your city administrator is a huge plus because he has a background and connections with legislative bodies. I thought that was kind of cool to call it there. Um, but again, lots of great um, ideas about Citizens Academy, um, transit systems, engaging with ITD. I mean, the, the good ideas go on and on. And so I really want you guys to be able to see that and have an understanding of it. Um, so that's just kind of a little flash forward of what those look like. Um, these plan, some of these comments also had a place physically um, within the city of, of Rathroom. So some of these, again, kind of go into those plans, programs, policies that become part of your comprehensive plan and become part of your implementation chapter. But some of these really needed to just have a place on the map. And so um, this isn't the easiest way for me to show you. My, my map, if I were able to connect you to my machine time, has, um, I can kind of zoom in and show you this. Um, but this just kind of shows you that as we go through all of your different comments, there were very definite physical locations for some of these within um, the city of them. So it could be at a specific intersection that you all, you know, we may have heard four times that you wanted an improvement at that intersection. We may have heard, this is a little piece of sidewalk here that's missing and we want you to improve that. We may have heard, um, you know, just, we don't think that this land is zoned appropriately. We think that you need to investigate putting this in another area. 
And so this map with all of these comments is also something that I will be providing to you so that you can look out and get an idea physically, you know, kind of where are some of these things located. Um, so you'll have that index of comments with the frequency and then you'll have these maps to look through and start to get an idea. What are people thinking? And um, it's all out there and it's all up for discussion. And I, you know, we have a little bit of the disadvantage of not being able to really see it. For instance, we can see here on this map ideas about, um, you know, an education corridor along uh, Lancaster and kind of capitalizing on what we have in that area, which led to some comments about maybe creating an urban renewal district in that area, similar to what NIC has done now in Um, You know, language related to, um, you know, supporting the Hunter Bypass, and we'll kind of see how that will interact with the community in the future. Um, so great information also there for you to be able to take a look at. Lots of comments here on that Highway 41 corridor as you move down toward Coast Falls. And how do you establish your community identity for the people that are entering into those halls? Um, Centennial Trail Connections, it goes on and on. So great stuff there. Um, so kind of getting into the heart of this, what are we planning for? We're planning for um, population, we're planning for growth, we're also planning for the existing residents and quality of life and all kinds of things. Um, but it is important as we look forward that we're looking at what that population will be. And so what we see with the, um, with the city of Rathroom is that basically in the next 20 years, you have a population doubling that will occur. Um, so you're just right at about um, 9,000 population, a little bit over right now. And really you're planning for an additional close to 10,000 people that will be here in the next um, 20 years. Now, this is with a growth rate and you can take a look at here at you know kind of how these population projections were derived. But we looked at the fact that we had some growth growth rates were dropping a little bit because we were coming out of a recession in 10 through 14. Um, we had a little bit of population increase as we were rebalancing our housing sales in 14 to 17. Had a little bit of a leveling off in 17 and 18. And so what we have here is an estimated growth rate of 3.73%. And 2012-2013 were eliminated. Now, if you go back and you look at any of the cities in Kootenay County, you'll see this, you'll see these patterns where, you know, they maybe went through a five, six year period with extremely slow growth, and then, you know, it picked up and it would get more aggressive, and we've kind of seen a, you know, boom and bust cycle in this general area, and we can go back over 50 years and look at that. But this is a little bit more of just a snapshot of what we're looking at right now. Um, these numbers were developed before the census update. Um, and so I have looked at recent some, um, census numbers and they, they do pretty much calibrate with that. Um, but the numbers will be slightly different, but it gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, so as you look to the future with your population, um, the things to be thinking about is that any of these numbers can trend up or down, of course, with the different things that are happening with the local economy. Um, but to look for your major housing developments and you know, maybe local employment that you bring in, and they, those can change your future growth patterns. Um, we'll look at how your land use regulations may be impacting growth. It may be that you don't have growth coming into your area because it's prohibitive. Um, it may be that you do have growth coming into the area, and, you know, maybe too much and it is too lax. So you, know, you can kind of use that to calibrate where you're at a little bit. And then, you know, look at your limitations, where do you have a lack of infrastructure, where is there a high cost of development? And this isn't so much to control growth, but just to understand that these numbers will shift depending on those types of things. So policy can play a role in it. Regional trends can play a role in it, lots of different things. Um, I would say that with a lot of the development that we've even seen in the last year, that we may feel differently about, you know, even these numbers that are, you know, fairly recent, um, even within, you know, a year from now. Um, but that's part of why you update your plan every five years and go through this process. Um, what we're looking at, when we're looking at those um, 10,000 uh, individuals that are possibly coming to the city of Rathrum, we're also looking at the housing needs. And when you look at the housing needs, you look at how many people per household and you, you, know, you divvy that out. And I think that when we looked at that, you were looking at the need to maybe have about, I think it was 3,300 new units. I didn't put that in here. 
Um, and so with that, we're kind of, we, as I mentioned earlier, we went through and did a buildable lands inventory, we actually drove the community, looked at areas compared it to what we knew of your zoning. And um, with that, really looked at where could development come in and infill, maybe with a five acre parcel or a 10 acre parcel that could be subdivided. Um, where are there areas where maybe there are the little onesie, twosie lots that could be created because you have an underlying lot of record or um, land that could be further subdivided? Um, so, how much land could or how much development could really be absorbed in city limits? And then, as you expand it outward, um, how much outward expansion do you do? And as we were talking about a little bit earlier with density, you're looking also at lot sizes, you're looking at things like that. So the bigger the lot size, the more consumptive of land you are, right? Um, the smaller the lot size, the less consumptive you are. And so this can really play a role in, you know, how do you determine what those, uh, that range of lot sizes is that's appropriate for your community? And so what we're looking, what we're doing is we're doing a buildable lands analysis. And so with that, what we've done is we've looked at the land and we have um, found out the lands where people have indicated any interest in the annexation. We want to account you for that. And this isn't, some of these are people who maybe have gone through the annexation process, but others are just people who are talking to the city or maybe coming in with annexation applications. And so we have um, those mapped. And, um, and so that we're aware and we're looking at that and not forgetting about who you're talking to. Um, we also looked at land that is currently developed, and I'll go through a couple graphics here and show you um, even some of these things. Existing lots of record, also owner's preference, so dividable land, where does the zoning allow for it? Um, and where are you limited by things like your steep slopes, your floodway, your utility easements, and then maybe public lands? And so with this, we um, have a tool then to kind of visually place growth in specific areas. And so what we're doing is we're actually modeling this using GIS software. And what, what we're doing is we're kind of, we've, we're inventorying right now the land that's available in the city. And that information has been given to your consultant. And we do actually have draft product now, but we haven't had a chance to look through that yet. And then that will be used in a GIS model to take different density ranges and model how you could grow outward from the city and what kind of densities, you know, where do you land, you know, in 10 years and 20 years, those types of things. Um, so these are just some, you know, examples of, you know, maybe different areas like where there's been annexation interest or, you know, here's a, a development where the lots are uh, currently developed, but when we ran through some of the early modeling, um, maybe it showed them it's still vacant. So we've worked through and we've removed what has already been developed. This is a neighborhood where there's a lot of different um, existing underlying lots of record. Um, so you may drive through that neighborhood and think that it's completely built out. But actually, if you go in and you look at the assessor's data, I don't have the line work up here, but you'll see that there are existing lots of record where another lot could go in um, in various areas in uh, a neighborhood like that. This is a neighborhood where um, we have a lot of um, common land ownership that's owned basically associations, so it's not subdividable. Um, but we have, you know, maybe one or two lots in there that could be further subdivided that are in HOA, subdiv HOA ownership. Um, here's an area where we're looking at uh, those steep slopes and saying, hey, you know, we need to come up here and we need to take this land out. It's not easy to develop. And it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be that you could develop it. It's just that when we're looking at where do we put this future growth, it's probably not a hot area where you're really going to start putting people up in these mountainous areas. Um, same, you have some floodway here in uh, Rathrum. And so let's account for the areas that actually have floodway, not floodplain. Floodplain can be developed in, but floodway um, is very, very difficult to develop in without um, studies where you're not basically affecting your floodway um, carrying capacity. And so, you know, removing that, but taking land in floodplain that could be redeveloped and accounting for. And so there's some areas here where you might be able to get some additional lots. Um, you have some pretty um, substantive utility easements uh, going through the city. And so there are areas when we really look at these where, you know, on a space it may look like a piece of land that could be developed. But in reality, it may have multi-family zoning on it. It may be bisected by a utility easement like this. 
And so we were to remove um, you know, all of those from the analysis. And then kind of going back to this first item, which is the um, areas of interest in annexation. And so this is just a map showing you um, different properties who, you know, where the property owners have been, you know, kind of talking to the city about possible annexation. And, you know, that could change as soon as, you know, tomorrow. But this is just kind of accounting for it, making sure that we're not forgetting anybody as we're going out and doing the planning in these areas. And so these are also areas that as we model the growth and we look at how, it, how will the city expand, um, we kind of look into those areas. A little bit of demographic information for you, Rathrum in comparison to Kootenai County. As so you look at the top chart, um, your male female population, um, your female population is slightly higher than um, Kootenai County. Your um, age is, uh, your median age here is 35.8 years and Kootenai County is 39.7. So pretty much running on par with the county, just slightly lower. Um, race, so there's a um, slight, a little bit more of a diverse racial makeup uh, here in the city of Rathburn. So just a quick little snapshot of um, what you look like relative to the rest of the county. Um, your population that is below the poverty line is um, slightly higher than the remainder of Kootenai County. And, you know, just kind of showing you your different employment sectors that you have. And uh, management, business, science, arts, and education tend to be higher. And then, you know, a little bit more of an even insulin with your service, natural resources, and your transportation um, occupations. Um, so again, just a little snapshot, it really gives you, you know, just as you're doing this planning and you're thinking about, okay, you know, what's our meeting age? Are we planning for families with um, children? There are communities that you could go into where the meeting age might be, um, you know, 60, and we may be planning entirely for, you know, kind of more of a retirement needs population. Um, so... And I don't have an example of that locally, but there are examples out there in the United States. So that's why it's important just to look at these and kind of just get an idea of, you know, who are we, who are we planning for? Um, so with this, in your updated conference of plan, there are a couple of um, new areas that we'll be focused on that either weren't in your past plan or that have come out of these interviews or, you know, that are just um, need to be addressed under state law. And I think we'll have a little bit more on public safety, telecommunications, um, definitely on emergency response and management. We saw that, you know, a high focal point. Um, snow removal, maybe just a little tiny component in there on that. Um, tying parks a little bit better in. Um, I think your last plan was a little more focused on recreation and on parks. Um, and you've just done a fantastic job with your parks. And so really integrating your new parks planning with that. Um, urban renewal is really new here to the city and really focusing in on that so that you can get a really good, strong start with urban renewal and start using it as a tool. Um, and we already, you know, as you can see, we've identified a couple of target areas for that. Um, creating some commercial nodes. So you know, this is where we kind of have to think beyond what we think of Rathrum as currently. And, you know, looking out as we move um, east on the prairie or we move to the southwest, um, especially as you're getting more residential areas, do you want to create little neighborhood commercial nodes? How do you want to interact with the future header bypass? Um, you know, things like that. Um, and then industrial districts, we have a lot of new industrial zone land, and what does that look like and how do you plan around it? And then this real organizational function, which kind of, you know, becomes part of that implementation chapter too. Um, so with that, where we think that these future joint meetings are um, headed is as we get the results of the um, buildable lands analysis, bringing that back into you and being able to show you, you know, kind of what that looks like, how do we model out growth. Um, looking into infrastructure and, you know, it's really important after we kind of look at where can we possibly grow that we look at what does the infrastructure look like in that area and is this something that we're capable of servicing. And, um, you know, it seems like Ralphram's um, done a great job of being able to service, you know, almost any area within the city. Um, but as you move into greenfield development, um, just making sure that we're examining that a little bit of it. Um, housing and neighborhoods, do we want a diversity and a range of housing types? What do they look like? Should we have a higher upper end than what we're thinking? 
Um, some people wanted, you know, a little bit more of these kind of rural lifestyle lots. Um, where would those be appropriate? Things like that. And then, um, you know, looking a little bit more at these commercial areas, how do you enhance that Highway 41 area? How do you move south as you move toward those falls? How do you look out as you grow out into these areas and really service the needs of many things? So I think these are probably going to be um, some of these future topics that we'll look at. Um, and then again, you know, hoping that as we move through this, that people will be uh, watching us on YouTube. Um, if you're interacting with anybody and they say, hey, what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to talk to somebody about XYZ PDQ. Um, just have them go ahead and send an email to this email address. And um, Carrie, Beyond, and myself are all on that email and we can all, um, you know, either work to respond or make sure that we tell people that we've received their email and, you know, how we might integrate that into the upcoming process. So we're in a little bit of a new world here with COVID on that whole public process. And so, you know, we're still filling out how we're going to work with all of that. Um, so with that, that's the presentation tonight. So just a general update of where we are and then um, knowing that we'll be providing you with that information on the rankings, the map, letting you know how that will work. And then, Leon, I sent you um, a couple of links that maybe you can take a peek at right now. And maybe if we go to Dropbox. Then, yeah, let's go to the Dropbox right now. We'll take a look at that. Um, so let's just let's just click on any one of these. That's fine. Um, so these are. Let me share it on the Zoom. Okay. 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 Um, so do you want to just close the, there we go, perfect, yeah. Um, so this is just a, a kind of a, a, this is using some of the GIS analysis tools to look at, um, in this case, this would be commercial, vacant, and underdeveloped lands. Now, we, as I mentioned to you earlier, we have gone through, we've done a first review. We're still in the process of reviewing this and providing feedback to the consultant. But this is what, um, what a map like that might look like. And so this is just to show you an idea. And maybe if you go back in and look at one of the residential ones, it might be a little more, or even industrial, might be a little more impactful. Commercial is a little. This is residential. Yeah. So this shows you some of these vacant and underdeveloped lands. So again, looking at all this criteria that we searched through and we're finding out where can you really do and build development in the city? And then, you know, how do you kind of grow out? And so in this case, you would probably be looking at those red areas, those areas where you could do some infill. But then as we move out, you know, into the outer areas, um, where do we do our development? So looking at a lot of these areas, you know, kind of that are proposed for annexation, or maybe it had industrial zoning, but it really should be residential zoning, you know, things like that. And so again, we're still working on this, but this kind of gives you an idea of what that end product might look like and what we'll be working with. And then we're modeling the growth out into that to show you how the growth will occur in those areas. And then if we go to the, um, the next email after that. So if you go up to the upper left-hand corner, you see the little layers that are up there next to what looks like a little checkbox. Perfect. Okay, and so you can see here, this is an interactive map. So again, we're using GIS. What you're seeing here is a map display, but GIS is an analytical tool. Um, and so you run through analysis where you're really like querying a database and you're creating results. And so we don't see that process happening here, but this is where you can start to see how we can turn on data layers and like if um, you know we are at the very bottom of that list. Uh, nope, we just scrolled down. I did actually go scroll down. There's a imagery now, so let's turn that on. And um, so we can, you know, we can do a lot with this tool as we move forward. They're modeling it for us, and we'll get some end results with the density. But we're also going to be able to use this tool to be able to go in 
and you know sit there and look at okay well what's happening on the underlying area is it used for ag is it used for mining you know what's going on there we can look at um, assessors data codes we can look at all kinds of different data we can you know really be able to work with that data versus just having a paper map in your hand um, so this is going to be a great tool for the city um, to use, you know, not just for this, but to use out, you know, into the future. And then you actually have um, a very talented employee here who does your GIS work, um, also who's been helping us with this, and he'll be able to use that in the future. Um, so this kind of shows you just kind of, you know, this is one where, you know, Leon's journal layer that we're looking at, and, um, you know, you can kind of, we can go in, we can look at the individual properties. So I just wanted to show you that. That's you know, the tools so we're not, you know, just kind of driving around and trying to figure out where things are. And we've done things like analyzing it against assessor's data, looking at use codes, you know, are there structures on it, you know, different things too to really kind of filter it in order to like we're getting you, you know, a really good picture of what you can do. Um, so those are a couple of examples of that. And um, then, like I said, we'll I'll be sending some um, products for you to take a look at. And they're pretty informal. It's just going to be these lists. And it's going to be this map that you saw with the comments on it. But just to get your, your minds, you know, kind of rolling around. What's the frequency of what we're hearing this? And what do I think about that? And, you know, and then as we move in this process, we'll be able to kind of wear this down to where we want to go. So, um, so that is my presentation. If you, if you have any questions, I'm more than willing to. Council, you have questions? Nothing from us. Very good. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. <clears throat> Man, I'm sitting here wondering if we shouldn't have taken the role for the P and Z also. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, just for the record, why don't we just have the PNZ members just state their name and then I'll let you know who from the PNZ we have on online as well. Okay. Just so we have something on record that we got a joint meeting. Okay. Austin Schumann, Planning and Zoning Chair. Kirk Carr, Planning and Zoning. Mike Compton, Planning and Zoning. We also have uh, John Hatcher online that's uh, participating online. Okay. Thank you guys too, by the way. I know you don't make the big dollars like we all do. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Let's move on to a brief staff report. Um, is uh, Kevin on for Public Works? He is. Turn him on there. Mr. Gell? Mayor, Council, good evening. Um, from the Public Works standpoint, a um, couple of things. One, we have suspended issuing right-of-way encroachment permits that pertain to any work within uh, the roadway section, which would involve pavement cuttings. Um, still dealing with some right-of-way encroachment stuff on utility poles and uh, underground installations, but outside of the pavement. And the reason why is because we are in winter maintenance mode. Um, asphalt is the, the plants have shut down for the season. Um, and as you know, we're going to be soon probably plowing. Uh, we've already done quite a bit of uh, mag chloride applications uh, to intersections, uh, roadways of curvature, um, uh, vertical roadways, those type of things. On to major projects, uh, the Meyer uh, Bakel Road uh, intersection improvements, which is a uh, multi-lane roundabout. Um, we have started the right-of-way acquisition process. So our consultant has reached out and made contact with all the property owners that are impacted. Uh, we've staked the right-of-way uh, for the majority of those uh, parcels. And the appraisals are in the process. Of, the appraisals have been completed, and they are now being reviewed by a, a review appraiser. So, we anticipate that uh, offers for acquisition of those uh, those right of way tracks uh, will be short. Um, will be soon coming. 
Highway 53 Meyer Road intersection improvements is uh, right on the tail, uh, or you know, right on the tail of the Bakel Meyer intersection project. Uh, we are still continuing to coordinate with ITD, uh, working through uh, the development of a memorandum of understanding. Um, but we all also anticipate that we will be starting the right of way services part soon. Uh, keep in mind that will be a, a formal agreement that will be presented in front of city council. Other than that, uh, mayor council, um, I don't have anything else. If you have any questions for me. Council, you have any questions? Nope. Thank you, Mr. Joe. One last thing I do want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas because I uh, probably won't uh, have that opportunity till till after the year. So, so Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, police department, is Tommy or Phil? Tommy is online, just needs to unmute her device. Chief? Chief, you need to hit star six so that you can unmute your telephone. Up oh, there she goes. <laughs> Chief. Chief, you with us? She's trying. Oh, then she went muted again. Well, she's working on it. Let's move forward and. Is Eric on? Yes, Eric is on. Mr. Singer. Eric? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, just give you a quick uh, staff report for Park and Rec. On the recreation side, we are at the tail end of our kindergarten through fourth grade basketball program. We'll be wrapping that up on December 19th. Uh, we're in the middle of registration for the fifth grade through eighth grade. That program will start at the uh, beginning of January, along with our indoor soccer winter kickers program. For community events, we recently had the lighted rig parade uh, last Saturday that went very well, uh, really well attended. We had more vehicles than we've ever had. Uh, uh, the mayor was actually part of that, so he may be able to speak better. I wasn't out on the route, but I heard there were a lot of people just out on streets watching the parade and participating that way. Uh, the Santa mailbox, is currently available at uh, Raftham City Hall and at our office down at Parks and Rec, so kids can drop off their Christmas wish list. The Deck the Homes Community Lighting Contest, uh, we're in the middle of that as well. So we'll be judging coming up on the 11th and 12th, and then the following weekend on the 18th and 19th. And we have, uh, I believe, 30 homes uh, registered for that event. So. You guys get a chance go on the website or on our Facebook page. There's a map that we've created where you can just click on each house that's registered and it gives you the, the name and the address. Uh, it's pretty easy to navigate so you can go around town and look at all the different displays. Uh, Santa call in is scheduled for Friday, December 11th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. We'll be taking calls at the Park and Rec office as well as City Hall. Reese Across America is coming up on Saturday, December 19th. That's at 9 a.m. at the Pine Grove Cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, on the park side of things, staff's just staying busy. They, they finished decorating, so they're moving on to winter projects. The big one we have is the new building at Majestic Park. We have that built and the next step will be pouring a concrete slab and then do the electrical. But the building has been built. I don't know if anybody has been out there, but it's a 30 by 40.
Any questions? The co building with a 14 foot sidewall. <laughs> I was open. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, you're welcome. Merry Christmas, Eric. Merry Christmas, you guys. We have the chief on? We do. Chief. Just a second. Okay, go for it. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Well, good evening, Council. Sorry about that. I'm having some computer difficulties. Um, let's see, we've had a busy month. Last weekend, we did all our shopping for holidays and heroes. We bought all the gifts um, and all the presents, all the food, and then the officers went out and delivered packages to five families here in town. So it was a great weekend. I enjoyed doing that. We helped Eric with the lighting parade. You guys need to give him kudos. I saw nothing but positive on that. The community loved it. There was comments all over how great it was. Eric did a great job on that. We enjoyed helping him. Coming up on the weekend of the 18th, um, we will have our cars out. There's going to be the North Idaho DUI Task Force will be out. Um, trying to keep people safe for the holidays, so we'll be out uh, looking for DUIs and trying to make sure people get right, keep everybody safe. And that's about all we have going on. Any questions? Questions, Council? Thank you, Tommy. You guys have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Tommy. Uh, we have Melissa? Yes, we do. Just a second. Finance reporting, Melissa Taylor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Hi. Okay, so just real briefly, um, kind of a busy month for us. Um, our longtime AP uh, clerk, Darlene Napier, retired. Um, as most of you know, or maybe some of you don't know, um, Lisa Stottinger, who was down at the police department, um, has slid into that spot. So she's taken over our accounts payable. Um, as far as uh, what we've been kind of doing, um, we, our department has been working on our COVID um, grant uh, uh, preparation and submittal that's due by Friday. We have turned both of those in. Um, we're also been um, working on as well as um, our audit prep has began for fiscal year 19 and 20, which was through 930 of, of 20. Um, in your finance report, moving on to that, if Leon could bring that up. I don't, I didn't see it in the folder, Melissa. Oh, okay. Um, oh yeah, I gave, okay. Um, I'll just briefly run through. We, we are in just the second month of our new fiscal year. Um, our revenues are coming in just as they're supposed to. Um, our non-business license and permits are already at 48% of what we've budgeted, which is good, which uh, primarily a lot of that is our building permits. Um, water fund, uh, everything's right, right about at the 20%, which is what we like. Um, expenditures are right where there should be around 15 to 20% for salary and other non-personnel items. Um, moving down, if you go um, our cash balance, um, the only thing really that's new is our diversified, diversified bond bank fund, which you guys had put $2 million into for a new city hall. Um, for the total funds being $22,705,347.59. Do you guys have any questions? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, you guys. Stay safe out there. See you here. Mr. Mayor, I'll be brief. Uh, just one thing to add to Melissa's financial report. She is working on a COVID reimbursement request. Uh, the state authorized up to $299,000 of COVID reimbursements uh, for the city of Rathrum. Uh, in addition to that, as you remember, we had the property tax relief. Um, the, about $600,000 that was issued to the city of Rathdrum through the governor's uh, public safety initiative uh, that helped to reduce the property taxes. We sent in that it was gonna be over 900,000 of public safety 
funds that we would expend between March and December. Um, so we are able to collect the additional 300,000 uh, that we had submitted through this COVID reimbursement stuff. So uh, we'll see the full three, $299,000 uh, be sent to the city of Rathdrum to help offset uh, expenditures. So that'll help out quite a bit. Uh, we were able to use the $600,000 as a property tax offset. Uh, we sent out with the water bills this last month, a detailed information about that so that people could see what that would do. We even uh, provided an example home so that it, people could see that. It was only related to the city of Rathrum's property taxes. It, all of the other districts that are on the bill are not affected by that uh, governor's public safety initiative. So schools, highway districts, fire districts, and so forth like that. Uh, the only two cities that participated in that was the city of Coeur d'Alene and the city of Rathrum. Yeah. Um, and so there was uh, property tax stuff that was done on that. One of the next steps that I'd like to do on this is I'm going to work with my escrow company because I have a home here in Rathdrum and submit a letter for them not to reduce the amount of money that I pay into the escrow on a monthly basis because of this property tax relief. And if the escrow company accepts that and, it, and does that, then what I'm going to do is send that draft letter out on the back of a water bill again so that the public can then take that draft letter, change the information for them, their property, send it to their escrow company so that they don't see a rise in the amount of property tax that they'll have to pay at the end of next year. So that should help. They still may get a tax or a check from their escrow company for this year because there was an overpayment, but we don't necessarily want to be an underpayment in the escrow account for the next year. So we're gonna work on that and try to get that out as well. Uh, see if we can work, get that going. Um, next month, the legislature will convene down in Boise. Um, there are already legislative bills that are surfacing. I did send an email out to the council on property tax bills that are surfacing. And uh, we had a meeting today to talk about some of those bills between the four cities within Kootenai County, uh, Hayden, Rathdrum, uh, Post Falls, and Coeur d'Alene. We did meet here at the city of Rathdrum to go over those things and talk about them. Um, there is a difference at the legislature this year Normally, the first few weeks, they work on rules, rules from Department of Health and Welfare, Depart you know, building department, so forth like that, all the different departments in the, in the state. They're pushing those rules to the end because I, my personal opinion with all of the COVID-related stuff, they don't know how short their session is going to be. So the meaty bills, usually the going home bills that they would wait until March to do, they're trying to focus in on those at the very beginning of the legislative session. So it'll be very interesting to see how that will uh, come about. Um, just as an information, Highway 41, um, the steel casing agreements that we issued, all of those been signed, have been returned. Uh, one property owner, Don Aristat, has actually already submitted his full $102,000 to the city for the payment of those steel casings. Um, there may be a little extra that may have to be charged when the actual expenses come in for those, but uh, he has already paid. And then the Jacklins, which are the ones that are doing the others, are uh, they're ready to pay us as soon as we bill them. So we're, we're doing that based off of if the steel casings are in the ground, we'll bill them for their amount and and we'll get those funds and also be able to pay off the state with those as well. So just an update on those. Uh, any other questions that you may have? Didn't, didn't the county uh, have the opportunity to, with that property tax relief, relief also in the opted out? Yes, they chose not to participate. It was, it's between counties and cities. And 
cities that have public safety. So a city like Hayden that doesn't have their own police department weren't really eligible to participate in that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the other ones, uh, it was only Coeur d'Alene and Rathrum that participated in that program. Up, up here. In, yeah, in Kootenai County. Yeah. That's it? That's it. Okay, um, I guess you've said everything. So no appointments at night. Council, Daryl? Uh, I don't have anything. Just want to tell everyone Merry Christmas. Steve? Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Uh, I have nothing. Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Paula? I just have a comment about the new roadway that's coming into Rathrum, where they um, cut down all those trees at Wayne Myers place on the corner of Lancaster and 41. That broke my heart. Other than that, Merry Christmas, everyone. Stay healthy and safe. Michael? Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. All right, so I guess it's up to me here. Um, without objection, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Without objection.